This next interview is with one of my favorite pro skaters ever, Billy O'Neill. One thing that really disappointed me was how little the royalties skaters were getting per skate. Right. Now that you own a company, what is your take on that and, and how do you approach it? Yeah, I mean, when I was young and I was a pro skater, uh, it used to be two dollars to two dollars and fifty cents per skate, which is horrible. Which is which is horrible, but it was the standard at the time. So I can't believe they got away with that. Right. We we were at the time really fighting for like five dollars, and that that seemed at the time the way they would uh, tell us like a um, and again, you're judging it right from the outside, and I'm not trying to be rude here, for sure, but me too. Yeah. I was like two fifty. You can't do five dollars, and then you know it took. I've said this on mm -hmm. previous podcasts before, but John Julio with them skates was able to do ten dollars for Sean Dar skate, mm -hmm. which was like revolutionary. Wow! And then it went to like jump from ten to thirty somehow. I heard God was was paying out a lot too. Frank, yeah. That, well, yeah. John yeah. set the standard, right? And you got to give that up to him. Do you think he passed that on? He, did he make the skates just ten bucks more expensive, or did he give more of the same kind of price? It seems like the skates are the same price as they've always been. It just things have been kind of reallocated. So yeah, um, for that kind of became the industry standard. And if you weren't doing those numbers, then you kind of weren't getting the respect and support of the community. Yes. Now, granted, there are a ton of uh, bladers who will support whatever they want to support because we have like this rebellious community, and they don't really give a fuck if skaters are getting <laughs> right. taken care of or not. Right. But um, you know, I've had one, two. I've had two pro skates. Both of them were reissues. Fifteen hundred on the first one, seven fifty on the next second one, twice, and then a thousand pro skates. So some somewhere over five thousand pro skates, where I got two dollars and fifty cents a skate. I look back and I was like, wow, if I would have got thirty bucks for that, you know, I'm making in like the yeah, that would have been a huge difference. Six figures, right? So but ten grand versus six figures is a huge difference. Oh, it's a huge difference, right? So just even like the exciting prospect of being able to like create something for this like sport and culture that we've invested so much of our time into is an extremely exciting process even if it's not benefiting yourself if it's benefiting like the giving, next generation. giving hope to the younger kids that are looking up because we looked up and we were seeing like some of our favorite skaters like working crap jobs after skating like you know like the the most talented people right on this planet are have also participated in rollerblading <laughs> Yeah, And those people, because their talents were directed in those areas, did not really see the uh, the, the benefits of it financially and b how whatever the systems were, 250 for a skate back and then. Yeah. So being able to offer that to skaters is, is amazing. Maybe that goes back to what we it's, said earlier uh, about how pain leads to progress. The pain that you felt yeah. led to you making this change with Mesmer. Oh, exactly. And like that's why we used to push the uh, the skater-owned uh concept back and they were like you support skater owned companies yeah because these people know what it's like to be out there skating for what we used to say peanuts mm -hmm. like we were skating for peanuts we were doing like you risk your body you risk your health you're sacrificing time that you could be spending developing another trade another yeah. skill like going to school because you're traveling and you're doing these things so and it's your youthful energies there's yes. something to be said for that. And so when you're dedicating that time and then you end up sitting there without very much, there you could it could bring resentment. It could bring a bunch of different kinds of feelings. And trying to reinvest even past your time into the culture where how can we make these changes? Where does it start? And it has to at least, well, you would think, and generally this is true, that it comes from people who would have that similar experience and don't want to see that continue to happen because you know it's a certain death for skating. And you need to, belief is a strong thing as we already acknowledged on this podcast. And you have to be able to give hope and belief into the future of skating to make it something that's prosperous for the future. I, I love that, man. I'm so glad you're doing that. I'm so glad that you're doing the podcast, Jump Street, which you guys should check out, um, Mesmer, and everything else that you've done, bro. Like, I'm glad that you're still in the sport contributing to it. You know, so many other people had to move on. Nothing against right. them. They, they have had, life to live. They, they had they, they to. Ha literally had they to move had on. They had to. Mm -hmm. You know, but the fact that you were able to stay and that I still see you ripping. I see you at those uh, first Sundays. Oh, stop. <laughs> bro. 
it's it's dope. But th- thank you, and and I really, first of all, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, it is a sacrifice, and a lot of the time, and you know this as a creative and someone mm-hmm. that owns your own company, like when you're trying to find solutions to problems, sometimes you just throw shit at the wall and see and see if it sticks. Yeah, like you know when an, I threw the a competition in 2011 mm-hmm. called the New York City Street Invitational. It was one of the first kind of similar to what the blading cup is now. I think it's also right. started the same year as yeah. the blading cup. We like um, blading cup hasn't stopped. We only did three years and mm-hmm. there's reasons for that, but we were trying to create a street like atmosphere in a competition setting. Yeah. And it was the intent and in a public place in downtown in um, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, where people could, who don't blade can see it. Yes. It's not confined away from everyone just for us to enjoy. It's, in that place where like high foot traffic is and they could walk by and they can experience what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. That was the intention behind that. Everything that's I've done from that event to jump street podcast to mesmer has all been with the same motive. And that motive is to how can we show people what it is that we're experiencing because you hear like the public perception of rollerblading sometimes and they're like, oh, it's this, it's that. And right. a lot of that, like, uh, well, at least in the past, there was like a lot of- A uh, shit talking. A lot of shit talking. And like, um, it was clear to me that the public perception of what it is that they, of what it is that we did was was wrong. They didn't know what it is. I'm like, wow, they, they're off. Yeah. They don't understand what it is that we're doing. How can we make them understand? Yes. How do we give them belief? So all of that, all of those efforts come down to that. How do we make what it is that we do grow? The podcast in a way where, hey, that person that you're enjoying their skating, there's more to that person. There's so much, like there's a depth there. There's, that person has something to say. They got something that they feel. The The skating competition was this is what we do. Right. It's not the X games. It's not that this is what it is that we do. And Mesmer to give belief and hope to the future generations. And not only that, but the talent that exists in the industry today and cult, uh, cultivating and nurturing that. So for me, it's, it's been a single mission goal for over a decade. I mean, for decades, cause like even in my own skating, like when I was pro, uh, back yeah. then, like 10 years ago was when I retired from being a pro skater myself and retired, <laughs> but like, right. but 10 years ago when I was, when I was like, I'm not pro anymore when I was 29 and I was, um, that w- it all came to the making people try to exp or not making people just to expose what it is that we, we see to be beautiful within skating that those who may hear about it in passing or who don't experience it, just what they do not understand, wanting them to understand it. I love it when we show skating to other people. I like when I'm too. skating in public and I, I notice other people watching, I'm like, ah, yes, I get to be the ambassador for the culture for this two minutes and try to make sure I do something that looks fun. Yeah. It's nice. No, it's really cool. And it's been, it's been frustrating because uh, for a while, because we have so many talented people in skating and when they found out a lot of the time that their talents within rollerblading wasn't going to be fruitful in any sort of financial way, they would take their talents elsewhere. And these are really talented people. They would become right. successful musicians in their own right. Mm-hmm. They would become successful in other areas of yeah, their a life. Lot of filmmakers, a lot of skaters, filmmakers, shooters, yeah, designers, yeah. But what would happen that is frustrating is because rollerblading is kind of like the black sheep, and mm-hmm. like if you, for example, as a filmmaker, you you get into you get into like Hollywood, and you and you're able to you, you're working with people, and and you say, hey, you know, I used to be a skateboarder, but like, whoa, your stock goes up a little bit. Mm-hmm. So there's a value in being able to say that you used to be a skateboarder, right? If you do that with blading. It doesn't necessarily do that. It Not all, off the first rip. Well, you have to almost I, show them. Be like, I, I did this shit. I think now it's different. Yeah, but I think in the past there was no incentive for anyone mm-hmm. who was involved in blading to flex to, about it. To flex about it, and yeah. you know what? It was hurtful because 
excuse me, mm-hmm. people that I went on tour with, like yeah. really close with, I've seen, I saw them go on to be like successful musicians and bands, successful in, in these other areas. And they would distance themselves as far as role baiting as possible because it would hurt their new endeavor. And they had also, there was like some traumatic relation to like right. working so hard, being so talented and achieving those things, getting those things done and then having nothing work out. So you know what? I'm wiping my hands with it. I'm not dealing with it anymore. I'm not going to say I did roller betting at all. That's the past me. But then you see some people like take those risks and it punished them. Like Dylan Cooper is a fantastic example. I don't know if you know who He's Dylan like a Cooper rapper, is. Right? Yeah. He's a rapper from mm-hmm. Brooklyn. And he brings that like old school. I think what they say is like boom bap style. Okay. Okay. So that's like the old school style, yeah. right? Okay. So like he brings that like boom bap style. And for me, he he's like one of the best rappers ever. In his first music videos, he had rollerblading in it. And he had like, he was like working. He had like deals where like people with Echo were like interested in doing things with them. And then they would hear about his blading, bring it down. I mean... I, I I don't mean yeah. to self promote, but we've had him on the podcast, Jump yeah. Street Podcast. Check it out if you want to go in depth. Absolutely. And, and YouTube, Dylan Cooper too. He's a phenomenal rapper, rapper, uh, and and musician in in general. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic guitar player and uh, just great person as a whole. But you see those people that did take those risks. Like I I am going to hold on to this and show that connection, and it hurt them. So you don't really you can't really blame people for separating that, but. It was uh, it was frustrating to watch that as someone who was still so heavily invested in rollerblading for years. It's almost like, why are you ashamed of us? But also, they're getting punished for it from the outside. It makes sense. No, yeah. I, I totally understood it. And and I was just talking with uh, my bandmate about it earlier today, but uh, there were a lot of people who, when when they were done, they were like, we're, we're done. Skateboarders don't do that because they go to the bar. Oh yeah, it's pro skateboarder. Oh wow, you pro skateboarder like Tony right. Hawk? It's like a whole. You, thing, you were yeah. freaking Tony Hawk. <laughs> oh fuck, you were Tony Hawk. Yeah, take a <laughs> shot. Like you know, people just like really sw- like that's why there's a lot of posing in skateboarding. You right. could just you could buy a skateboard deck and like walk around the mall, not know how to ollie, right. and there's a social incentive there. Yes. That doesn't exist or it hasn't existed traditionally in rollerblading. Yeah, yeah. not until super recently. I think recently people are more open to it. I still don't think that it gives you the social credit that skateboarding would Not give you. Not the already understood social credit score, But people right? are yeah. open yeah. To, to being like, what is that? Yeah. What, like, I think that's it's happening. It's more of that. Now. They're more yes. curious. They're like, oh, that's cool. I didn't know you could do that on rollerblades. Yes. Mm-hmm. A lot of people still don't even know we can do tricks. I, well, a lot of people still don't even know what it is that you're talking about. <laughs> I do I do skating. What? Skateboarding? No, rollerblading. Rollerblading? Like what? Like... Like like circles. I like, usually tell like them, in Venice. Everything you think a skateboarder can do, we do that but on rollerblades. I like when I'm telling somebody who doesn't do it, I'm like, what you think skateboarders do? That on skates. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't use that to describe it, but but, but I'm saying I like in terms saying. of how quickly I yeah. can describe to them. I'm like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, like, gotcha. You know, like, yes. like what do you do? I'm like rollerblading. What do you mean? I'm like, yeah. You know what you think skateboarders do? That. Yeah, we do that on rollerblades. Yes. Plus yes. other shit, but on generally speaking. Yeah. Exactly correct. Yeah, I think that's a good way to describe it. 